All right. Round two here. Okay, so the gray snapper, complex life histories, uh, along with the lane snapper. So why would changes in the abundance of lane snapper and gray snapper matter? Well, well, first is potential fishery impacts due to their interaction with the native species. And primarily we're thinking about red snapper here. But if you look over there on the top right, there's a plot of fishery landings from the state of Louisiana going from you know, the last 25 years or so. That's uh, catches of gray snapper and you can see the trend. They're going up. I mean, I'm sorry, yeah, gray snapper. They're catching those things in greater abundance than, than we had and certainly there was almost no catch back in the 1980s. Uh, the other thing that, that we think about is altered trophic flows. And I've already alluded to that. The, the emerald parrotfish are herbivores. They feed on seagrass. Uh, what might this do to, to the way energy is transferred in those seagrass habitats? And then finally, there are a lot of unknown interactions that we might expect between the natives and the tropical species. So I've had a PhD student named Tony Marshak who's been looking at potential interactions between the two species of tropically associated snappers and the, the resident red snapper. And he's done a, a number of experiments to, to look at this. And, and the, the, the slide here is something taken from fish base. And what it shows you is the relative likelihood of occurrence of the snapper family. And where it's red, that means the likelihood is high. You can see here in the northern gulf, there's a little yellow patch sort of indicating that these, these snappers have not been common. And really the only species that, that was present in, in significant numbers in the past was the red snapper. And I've got dollar signs up there by the red snapper because it's the money fish in our area. People that, that go out on charter boats, they feel like they've not had a successful day if they don't bring home a red snapper. So it, it's really an important one. Yes. It's hard to tell because of the scale, but you know, you're, one thing that was concerning me a bit was the 70s data was well to the east. Mm -hmm. Is that in the red area here? Mm, no. They're, they're I, I, can't tell I, don't, I don't think so. No, I don't think so. I'm concerned about that. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I, I don't think that's, it's probably further south than that, than that Appalachian Bay area. Well, I mean, you saw our collections. I mean, they, they just weren't there in the 1970s. So, yeah, so the, the grays are, and, and uh, lanes have been less abundant than red. And the other thing to, to keep in mind is the red snapper have a total offshore life history. So they don't use the seagrass habitat during year one. They stay offshore in schools um, on soft bottoms. So Tony's work had several objectives. Uh, he was interested in potential competitive interactions between the subadults of the red, gray, and lane snappers. And he did this work in mesocosms. He looked at prey consumption rates. He looked at potential interactions, behavioral interactions uh, between these species. And he did these experiments in the outdoor mesocosms. He videotaped them, filmed them all. And he used blue crabs as the, the prey item. I have no idea why that happened. <laughs> Anybody got any thoughts on this? All right. OK. So. <laughs> The work was done in the mesocosms. He did a series of additive and substitutive uh, experiments to look at both inter and intraspecific competition. So he looked at red snapper, gray snapper interactions. He looked at red and lane snapper, then lane and gray, and then all three species together and looked at their, their behavioral interactions and their prey consumption rates. So he also did uh, monospecific trials looking at different densities of three, six, and nine individuals to, to get a handle on intraspecific competition. So while he was doing this, these experiments, the lionfish started to become common in our area. So he also wound up doing some trials where he looked at interaction between red snapper and lionfish. And again, these are subadult sized snappers. So just to, you know, as an aside here, I was going to point out that. We do seagrass surveys for the Park Service every year along the Gulf Islands National Seashore. And one of my students was out doing this survey and came across this little individual there in the, the center of the, the picture. And this turns out to be a juvenile lionfish. Uh, she didn't know it. She picked it up in her hand and brought it, brought it back. And you know, we're wondering if there are lots more of these juveniles out there, but we just haven't noticed them because they're so hard to see and they're very fragile. So, I mean, people have wondered where the juveniles are. I'm not sure that, that we may see some more of these in the grass beds. Okay, back to, to Tony's results. So, what he found is that red snapper seem to be more aggressive than the, the lanes and the gray snappers. Uh, they seem to be quite able to compete for food. They will take the, the uh, blue crabs 
over the, the uh, comp potential competition from grays and lanes. Uh, fishermen kind of know this. Red snapper are known for biting hooks. And some of our video stuff would show that, that other species are out there, but as soon as the hook comes down, the red snapper jump out and bite them. But they, they seem to be pretty aggressive. Lionfish, however, were the most active and, and aggressive of all. As soon as prey came in there, they would nail them, and much more so, much more quickly than, than even the red snapper. Um, you know, there are lots of other species uh, on these reefs, and we haven't investigated that, but surely there, there are plenty of other things that ought to be done looking at some of the other uh, resident reef species and interactions with some of these tropicals. So uh, we also try to look at potential interaction between these snappers and the resident species in the grass bed, so during the first year of life of these species. So I had a, a master student, Becky Yerke, who um, did this work, and we had a, a paper come out last year on her thesis work. So the question was, what kinds of, of effects might these tropical species have on the native pinfish? And we chose pinfish because they're so abundant in these grass beds. So those of you that have sampled, you know, I don't have to convince you of that. But it's common for them to be 85% of all the demersal fishes that you catch in these grass beds. So they were the, the most obvious species to look at for potential interactions. So why, why look at that the pinfish with the snappers? Because they feed on the same things. Their stomach contents show that they feed on small crustaceans. They occur in the same habitat. Therefore, you might expect there's, there's high potential for some kind of competitive interaction. So to do this, we used uh, uh, multiple before-after um, control impact design. And this is a, a Bakke design with multiple comparisons. And the way you do this is take samples before and after event in both impact and control sites. So in our case, we had two treatments, the before and after and the control versus impact. And the control uh, stations were those that did not have any of the snappers at them. The impact stations were those that had snappers. The, the before part was that when we sampled in the springtime, there were no snappers present. They don't recruit until late summer or early fall. So we had samples from a number of different areas without snappers in, in the, the early summer. Then later on, we had some of those areas that did have the snappers present. And we could look at the potential effects on pinfish abundance and growth rates. And that, that's kind of what we did. And the, the virtue of the, the Bakke design is it removes the, the existing differences between the control and the impact sites before you start. We know that all, all locations are not similar. There are some differences among them. Let's remove that and sort of correct for that before we do the comparisons after the, the event has occurred. And that's what we did. So the methods were to do our sampling from the Chandelure Islands to St. Joe Bay. We collected <coughs> pinfish, 30 in, up to 30 individuals of pinfish at each site in the summer before the snappers arrived, and then in the fall after some of the stations had the snappers. So here are the, the sites. There are actually three of them that we call control sites. Uh, the, these locations here in the summer, and here are impact sites. Then you see in the fall, after the snappers arrived, this is catch per unit effort in, in the numbers there. So this would be in Middle Bay, there were no, there were not, you know, zero snappers present, but they were, they were quite rare that turns out to be 0.11 individual per minute trawled. So that's, that's what that CPUE is. It's the, the catch per one minute of trawl. And you can see at those other sites, they're, they're quite a larger number of individuals, an order of magnitude or even more higher individuals of the snappers at the three bottom sites, so Horn Island, Big Lagoon, and St. Andrew. So we did this by looking, we did the growth rate studies by looking at the otoliths, and we've heard about this plenty of times. They're the ear bones that lay down growth rings. And we looked at the last 10 increments, which would be the last 10 days of growth. And there's Becky at the microscope. And there, there's a, one of the, the otoliths, and you can see the, the growth bands there. So what she concluded was that there were no significant effects on abundance. But there actually was a trend for more pinfish to be present where the snappers were present. Now, what this, this could be, we, you know, we're not sure. One possibility, maybe larger predators are feeding less on pinfish because they've got alternative prey in the form of some of these snappers. That's, that's one possibility. There's certainly others. There are no significance in growth either, but there was a trend towards slower pinfish growth when the snappers were present. Uh, potentially